All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. Today, I've got an amazing show for you and an amazing guest. You don't get guests like this all the time. Um, David Latham is a an amazing gun dog trainer, legendary in his own uh, right, and has won the IGL, the International Gun Dog League, four times, which is a record, I believe. And um, I'm just going to bring him on. There's, there's not much I can do to introduce him because I could be here all day introducing him, and I'm just going to bring him on. So, uh, Dave, there you are. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. It's good to see you. How's, uh, let me see, how's uh, everything over there in England doing? Uh, it's, oh, it's, it's still raining, so it's that, so it's good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, every, everything's, <laughs> yeah. It's been a strange old year for everyone in England, as it is in the rest of the world, hasn't it? But, you know, we're, we're pushing through now. We're starting to train our dogs again, so that's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. How was the training going this year with all the with all the crazy pandemonium? Mm, it has been it has been difficult. Yeah. It was good in between after the first lockdown, you know, after March, and then uh-huh. we got stuck back into the dogs, and we had a good good August and a good September and a good October, and a good early start on the grouse, so it was going really well. And then, of course, we got back into the, the second lockdown and everything stopped. But, you know, the first three or four months were, were very busy. It was really, had a, it was really good at a cracking start to the season. Uh-huh. So it was nice. Well, did, it, did it affect you from going out and just training your own dogs or from competing and, and training with other people or what? Yeah. You mean actually during the lockdown? Yeah. Yeah. During the lockdown. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was I mean, you could only... You couldn't travel out of your own village. You could. You couldn't. Re- you you could only go out once for exercise. Wow. So I was lucky at the time. Um. Yeah. I moved. I moved to my sister's house where she has a little bit of land with a with a boyfriend. Uh huh. So I'd got ten acres there. I could go and just carry on doing a little bit of basics and keep them fit. So, you know, where the people in the towns and the villages were were really struggling. They couldn't do nothing for months. So it was quite a big uh-huh. disadvantage. Yeah, that is that's that is a huge disadvantage. Now, how many dogs do you have that you're currently working now? Uh, I have six six at the moment. Wow. Um, oh, Dell, the old old IGL championship winner, he's retired now. Just does a little bit of picking up. Uh huh. Bailey, uh, he's also retired now. So four I'm actually competing with. Uh huh. And how old are they? Uh, the youngest will be Blue Creek Curtis Cash. He's just about 20, 22 months old now. He's nice. hopefully going to be my novice dog for this coming year. I'd like to take him to Scotland on the on the grouse in August. Uh-huh. And I have uh, Meg, uh, a young bitch I won with last year. Uh, oh, this, oh, this year now, last year. She's very promising, actually. She's absolutely lovely. Wow. She's now open dog, so I'll be pushing her hard next year. And then I have my two young dogs, field trial champion Fenderwood Harold, a dog I made up into champion last year. Nice. And the young dog I made up for Mr. Freakin this year, Mr. Freakin's dog, field trial champion Meadowlark, Big Rock. So they're only four and a half, five years old, so they should be coming into the prime this year. So, you know, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. So when you, uh, you're saying about the basics and stuff like that, what, what is the basics for you when you start with a young dog? What, what, how do you start getting the dog conditioned to handling and to training and to the field environment and stuff? Well, yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can give me a short answer if you like. <laughs> yeah, it depends. <laughs> yeah, yeah so it depends what age you're talking at, really, you know. So um, what, Let's what, say what a age, green dog. roughly what age... Let's say a green dog. Let's say yeah, if, you know, just under dog. a year. Yeah, just under a year of age. Right. At that age, I think, to be honest with you, this is a very important age and an age where people do far too much. Mm-hmm. I think far too many people are trying to instill steadiness. I think, like most people, your first dogs, we never seem to get them steady enough. They'll run in <laughs> in the first competitions or, mm-hmm. you know, and we always think, oh, I have to get them steady. And that's always in the back of people's mind. Mm-hmm. What they do then is they overtrain the steadiness too much, too soon. 
and they take all the natural drive and, and vigor out of the dog, you know. Mm. And it, I don't know why, but <clears throat> once you do too much with a young dog too soon, they never seem to get that that go back, that drive. Excuse mm. me. So I like to keep them quite free, really, up until they're a year of age. Mm. Get them hunting hard for the tennis balls. You know, there's no steadiness. My dogs are not steady till they're a year at the earliest. Okay. I'll still be holding them on a on a check check lead, or I'll put my arm around them. You know, mm. basic memory, basic mark. But I want I want that drive. I want that go, and I want mm. that enthusiasm. So I mean, up until that that stage i would just really be doing maybe up to up, up to a double mark mm -hmm. a double memory but where i'm still ho actually holding the dog or oh, the dog's on a lead and i'll let him slip the lead you know mm -hmm. i want to keep that enthusiasm and then after then we'll depend on the dog's personality and uh, again that's where I'll, i think people make a mistake they don't look at a dog like a person where we all have our own personalities and we're all different mm. and you can find out by talking to me today where I'm weak at, where I'm strong at and I think they see a dog as purely a dog mm. where they think it's because it's a Labrador and it's a shooting dog it does it naturally and sometimes we have to help them dogs mm. and and teach them some are, some are strong at some points and weak at other points they're mm. not all the same, that's the big problem so that's why, uh, as a trainer, you got look look at the dog, use your common sense, and yeah. and adjust your training accordingly to the to the temperament of dog you have. Yeah. Do you think most people will ruin a good dog by doing too much or too little? Probably too much, mm. especially at an early stage. Yeah, you know, especially people who who only have one dog. And they're mm -hmm. re really keen, spend a lot of time, you know, and they just they just do take that natural drive out of them. I mean, yeah. I can always tell when I, if I take a lesson and I have someone come and I say, how old is your dog? Oh, it's 10 months old, 12 months old or nine mm -hmm. months old. And it's sitting there like a statue, brilliant. I think, oh, here we go. <laughs> Same old story. <laughs> you, know, you can tell straight away they'll be, they'll be, they'll be boring and they'll be boring mm -hmm. for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. And so you like to give the dog the freedom. You like to actually use the dog's drive and their personality um, along with them, right? You want the dog to actually be a dog and you want to harness the energy and then put that into yeah. something. Yeah. 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 Let, let it grow up. Let it, let it mature. I mean, you, yeah. you, can, you, can, you can help them by, you know, by, 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 by I like, like them to hunt. I, mm -hmm. I want to... Uh, having the drive and the enthusiasm on a mark retrieve so they're mm -hmm. enjoying it i mean i think people are they're too busy doing sit stay throwing un hundreds of dummies around the dog mm -hmm. and then they want to get them out in, in company too soon you know mm -hmm. again in, a big thing especially for you know a field trial dog that's got to walk all day it's got to be at heel you can't speak to him one little noise you're eliminating that's why temperament is is paramount that's the most important part of yeah. breeding and it, it do get them in company too soon get them wound up get them excited dogs making noises you know let let, let them mature and, and and grow up a little bit how how much of that do you think is genetic and how much of it do you think is training like the overall drive and the, and the steadiness of the dog mm. Yeah, so a, a, a good question, really. I would say a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. And for sure, genetic-wise, I, I think like squeaking does come through certain lines. Some dogs mm -hmm. are, are more hyper. Yeah. And, and but <laughs> then again, a lot. Dogs. I mean, we, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think we've all had one, haven't we? But yeah. um, I think also with so certain people, mm -hmm. some people are very, very intense and, and don't realize they're putting a lot of mental stress on these dogs, you know, mm -hmm. and the dogs can feel it, can't they? The dogs can pick up on it. Yeah. You know, you, you need to be re relaxed within yourself if possible. Mm. You know, so, so that, all that, all that enthusiasm that we have and that natural drive to win, like you don't want that coming down the lead into the dog, do you? 
Right. You have one of those dogs that's a little bit hot, what we call hot in England. Mm-hmm. You know, then that's where the problems start in it, and and they can feel it. it comes down the lead. Is that would you say a huge problem that the, the owner's nervousness or the owner's insecurity, the owner's ego going through to the dog can really screw up a dog from being a champion like what you deal with and just kind of ba- barely making it? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a long way to be coming to be a champion, but um, I think it does it affects certain people. You, you, you know, certain people always seem to have problems with the same things, don't they? Like mm. maybe a dog that's making a bit of noise, and and, and sure, it, it comes through them, and the, you know, the dog, dogs dogs can sense it, can't they? Mm. They can. I mean, my my dogs. I mean, when I correct my dogs verbally, and and and, and I shout at them if they've gone wrong. Mm. And they, they know that's part of training, but when I'm really mad, and then, then they know the difference. Mm. So although I, I try to make them feel sometimes that I'm mad just verbally by my voice, mm. they, for sure they know the difference when I'm proper mad. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what, um, I talk a lot to people about um, structure in training and, and, and such, and I wonder um, how you feel about that because if you're dealing with such high-end dogs um what do you feel when you when you're talking about structure in training a dog how do you impose that how do you see that and and how much importance do you put on that do you mean, do you mean at the structure house what i would do at what stage and training wise mm-hmm. just elaborate on that a little bit so like structure, I always believe that, you know, as much as I think a puppy's got to be free and a puppy has to have a really good time and be able to be mature, there has to be boundaries. And those boundaries would be in oh, the yeah. day to day and they would be in the as well as in training. And I'm just wondering how you apply that or how you see that in your training. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like my dogs to have the freedom. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I'll go and give them a, a run before I go training and I'll let them play a little bit. And but I, I think when if you're going to do that, is it, pick somewhere where they can't get into trouble, you know, where there's not a lot of game scent or rabbits or pheasants where they can mm-hmm. commit a sin. And mm-hmm. then I'll let I'll let them be, you know, let them be pups, let them be dogs, let them go and have a run, have a sniff, and have a pee. I have no problem with that at all. Mm-hmm. But then once they come back in, then and they put them on the lead, and and then when you start training, and then it has to be serious. So mm-hmm. I think the they have to know the difference. And again, where some people are too strict with them all the time, where they'll never let them go out, they'll never let them run, they'll never let them have a pee. Mm-hmm. And I think that's too intense. It's too too, too strict. Yeah. You know, they have to have that happy balance. And the same with you or I. If you're happy doing your job, you do a better job. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, T- tell me when you when you're looking for a pup that you have a lot you have four pups now that you're using or six you said all together but but four that you're working when you first want to get a puppy when you're saying okay I'm going to pick my next um, Bailey or or Dell or whatever what do you look for in that seven eight week old five six seven eight nine week old puppy what what is it that triggers you to go that's the dog that I'm going to take to the top. Yeah, yeah, it's very, yeah, very good question. Very difficult to pick a puppy, but yeah, there's certain things that I try to e- eliminate first. I mean, f- first I like good, nice, straight legs, you know, and, and paws, where the, the paws are, are nice and hard, and not not a splayed foot, you know, uh, mm-hmm. a, a dog's up on up on its toes like a running like a running dog, mm-hmm. nice straight legs, and I hate. I hate gay tails, you know, any puppy with a tail up here, I mean, Mm -hmm. that's our way to one side straight away. (laughs) I want a nice, low, (laughs) nice, Mm -hmm. low, flat tail action. Mm -hmm. You know, a a dog that's tails low and and working and when it it sees you, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, when you're you're competing, you take a dog like like Fenderwood Harold's got a beautiful tail action. You Mm -hmm. know, when when he's wagging his tail, I think when you're judging a dog, if you've got a dog with sparkle, with tail action, you're mm. going to get that a little bit longer. It looks nicer on the eye, mm. you know, so that, that that's important. You know, something that looks like it's keen, wants to be with you. I, I like that a, a lot, a puppy that mm. wants to follow you, that wants to be with you, you know. Them type of things, one that's obviously not 
doesn't look like it's going to be short in the leg. The, the, mm. the, I try to eliminate the obvious things you can see first, and then I'll go into you know its personality. You know, does it look like it wants to chase a ball? Will it, you know, put a little ball and a little bit of cover? Does it want to hunt even at those early stages? Mm -hmm. All of those type of things I'm looking for in a puppy, but it is very difficult. It, it is right. And do, do you ever get disappointed or surprised? Like, like, wow, I didn't think the dog had that or boy, I thought the dog did have that when, when you pick a puppy and, and later you have it in its later years. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think they're, they're, they're forever surprising you, aren't they? Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you, you don't know, you don't know what, what, what's going to happen with them. And I think that's mm -hmm. the beauty of, of training the young dogs. And mm -hmm. when you have an older dog and it's it's fully trained and you know what they'll do, yeah. like like today where I've been out with with, with Cash today, on this nice piece of ground I got with these big valleys and you, you see a young dog progressing and getting from A to B across those big valleys in one cast running to shot and you know all the time they're surprising you and, and maturing them, you know yeah it's nice to see. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and in your training, when you go out, for example, with cash, what did you do today? Did you do a lot of more retrieves, more steady work? You have your other dogs with you as well. I'm sure when you're out there, right? Yeah. T today, um, where I've been today is like a, a lovely long valley with all mm. bracken on the sides and the, the bracken's low now at this time of year. So it's, it's really super for training. So we put a series of memories as we walked out on the left-hand side. Now these were, or well, oh, we let the dog see these as with my friends. So we put two in each zone. We, we picked like points where we could remember. Some, t some places we picked a point where they would have to go through some thick cover from the other side where we wanted to keep them on line. And then through that, through that zone into a wood at the back. And then we picked another zone as we, this is all as we're walking down along mm. perhaps 200 yards and then we put a third zone and we, we walked around the valley and we came back and we, we picked a location where we thought it would be difficult where because i want the dog to hold its line and the, these dogs were going down the valley and the mm. natural shape of the valley would would push the dogs off to the left hand side mm. so as we walked along we picked a tree where we knew this would happen and we wanted to go to go straight so this in my way of thinking this is kind of setting me dog up for a fall because i mm. knew the lay of the land would take him left-handed so it would give me the opportunity to, to correct me dog which is exactly what cash did he took a first lovely line a little bit of light cover he followed a track and it pushed him off to the left so th that's where i stopped him or went out to my dog or walked him back put him on the correct line and resent him. You know, mm -hmm. Then then he took the line I wanted, pushed him through the cover. I brought him back then and I went back to the top of the hill and I, and I resent him again straight away. And this time he held his line. So to me, that, that that's good. You know, mm -hmm. he, he's gone wrong, I've corrected him, he's done it right. So today we did a series of those. We did those three retrieves, which were all of a big distance, 300 yards through cover. A lot of game sent on the ground at the moment. So that, that was the first part of the exercise we did. Then we did it the opposite way around. We, then we dropped true blinds, which the dogs had not seen. And this time we put them on the sides of the valleys because it's I think it's a natural instinct to, when you have a nice piece of ground is to get the dogs go up and down the valleys because it's, it's, it's eye catching, it's stylish. But mm -hmm. very rarely we go along the valley. So this time we put true blinds along the valleys in the cover, which proved quite difficult. And uh, we picked those. And then to finish off with, we went one side and the other. And I, I like to put the dogs home on a happy note. So then we gave them a, a single mark and a double mark and let them fly across the valley then, put the bracken up, pick and come home. Mm. And then they were just about tired out after that series of, of retrieves. But that was mm. a, a, a basic session for the dogs today. And how many, how long do you train each dog for? Do you, do you really push them to their limit or do you kind of, uh, I mean, you obviously know what their limits yeah, are. Yeah, 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 I mean, I mean, the, the two dogs I've had out today are, are, are really physically fit, you know, the, you know, to, mm. to get up and down this ground where it's the steep banks. Uh, well, I've been out majority of the day. They've probably been out for two hours each. 
Okay, wow. But by the time you've walked around, set the retrieves up, come around, but they've they've had eight eight retrieves in perhaps two hours. Okay. You know, wow. cor correcting them, putting them right, giving them a little break, and then mm -hmm. my friend doing the same with his dog. So that's I like about what you a, said. An average session. There's a really important thing you said. I just want to stress on it again. So many people don't do this, and it's something I find successful trainers always do. And you said ending on a happy note, right? Can can you talk more about that? Because I think dogs, from my experience, always remember the last thing they did before you put them back up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I mean, that's what I like to do. You know, I mean, give the dog some confidence. You know, because mm -hmm. the first two thirds of the train exercise was very technical, holding a line through heavy cover mm. where the dog could go wrong, which the dog did go wrong. Then he was corrected and made to do it right. So obviously, yeah, you're putting pressure on that dog. And they, mm -hmm. they have to withstand that pressure. You know, mm -hmm. if they can't withstand the pressure, then they're not the dog for compete. So after I've done that and I was happy with that, and then I wanted to give him what he wanted. You know, straightforward, mm -hmm. big, long mark retrieve, let them fly up and down. And again, with the, the with this land, it's sandy ground on a valley, mm -hmm. and they love it. They can really gallop, and they mm -hmm. get out there, he picks, mm -hmm. and I like like them to do the marking on their own. You know, mm -hmm. unless he's going really out out of the area, let him be natural, pick it, and come home. You know, and then he. He's, he's gone back to his kennel and his, in, I feel like in his mind, he's had a great day. Mm -hmm. I, they both learned a little bit and it's, it's ideal. So what I want to ask you about is, is what makes you tick? Like why, and, and I, I, it's a really loaded question because I'm sure it's, it's a very hard question to answer, but you are huh. at the top of your game. Right? And you're, I know you're very humble, so you're not going to say it, but you're at the very, very top of your game. What mentally, more than anything, separates you from the average person? And people have asked me that in questions of martial arts and stuff. But I'm always interested in a person's yeah. mental strength. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a good question. It is quite a difficult question to answer because you know. Sure. But um, I think what really drives me now, it may have changed a little bit. I think at the beginning. It was I just wanted to win, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I watched I watched a field trial many many years ago when I first went to picking up at Checkley. I watched John Alstead and his wife Sandra, and uh, I didn't realise Labradors could do that type of thing. And I was completely impressed, and I loved it. And I thought that's what I want to do because prior to that, I was keen. I was picking up. I was shooting. When I saw that, I thought, wow, you know. And then. The competition kicked in in me, the drive to win. But now I think it's slightly changed a little bit. It, it's it's a, it's a, it's more the fear of, of losing that drives me on. <laughs> so I feel oh. I have to be better. I have to do more, and that that pushes me more. And you know, like, like I've, I train now with a gang of young younger men, mm. we're really keen, and that's brilliant. You know, and I think that's a good thing for anybody. Try and train with people who are better than you. Mm. people who are going to push you on not yeah. not you don't want, want me going there and be top dog right. you want to be thinking way up his, his dog's better than mine today and if you've got that want to succeed that want to will that drive mm. and mm. it'll push you you do it, do mm. it naturally and you know these lads who i train with now they're all oh, the dogs are really good if i'm not on my toes then i'm, I'm going to come last and <laughs> that's what we don't want yeah, you don't want that. So you're, you, you say you went from a, a passion of winning to a fear of losing. I think that's so powerful because those are the things that really, really drive yeah, us so is, much, yeah, don't they? Yeah. Did, did yeah. you ever do any other sports Just, when you were younger? Yeah, I played football for the local, for, for my school. Ah, okay. And for a local pub team when I was a young man. Uh -huh. Did a bit of clay pigeon shooting. But I think more and more I got into the dogs, everything else just slowly yeah, you just don't have time, yeah, totally you know, and, and it's not, <laughs> it's not boring for me. I go out every day and train it. You know, it's a passion. I love it. It's not, it's not difficult. <laughs> right. you know, I, don't, I don't think I won't go and do anything else. So it's, it's yeah. quite easy. <laughs> yeah. So did you get into dogs? Like in other words, did you get into it as a trainer or did you have dogs as pets? So a dog that you really loved or maybe a first, a first oh, yeah. Labrador you had? 
Yeah. No. Well, my dad always had what we call r running dogs, like uh, mm. whi whippets, cross greyhounds for catching rabbits and hares when I was a young boy. Mm. And that's how really, that was the first dogs I can remember. And then I started doing a little bit of shooting with my friend at school. And they had a cross um, spaniel Labrador, Susie her name was, she was a cracking dog. And I said to my dad, uh, I want a, a gun dog. So I said, I, I fancy a spaniel. And my dad said, you're not having one of them spaniels, they're crazy. So <laughs> I think for my 14th birthday, my dad bought me a black Labrador. And that's how it started. <laughs> oh, wow. And who, what was it? What was his name? What, yeah, was the, so, what, what was the first dog's name you had, the first black oh, Labrador? The, it, it was a bitch, actually. Yeah, but she was oh. called uh, Gunstock Selena Sally. Yeah, oh, black, a black bitch from a local a local gamekeeper like yeah. She was a it turned out a good bitch. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing you guys have in England, which is so cool. You have the coolest names for dogs. I mean, uh, Janet has this book. Let me see this book here for a second. This book that she showed me, and, and you're you're mentioned in it many, many times, the best of the best. I'm sure you know that book, right? But you're oh, yes. uh, very yeah. interesting book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Janet is 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 the um the, the aficionado for gun dogs. I'm I'm a I'm a dog fan and trainer, but she is she studies these things and knows these things. She's a big fan of yours and stuff. But your names, you have the coolest names of dogs. Americans, their names just oh, aren't yeah. that great. But you guys have, have it just, you know, the, the coolest name. So I don't know how you come up. How do you come up with those yeah. names? Yeah. Like, good, like, good uh, question. <laughs> like, do you make them up or do you, do you have, like, is, there a, is there a secret meeting <laughs> of people who yeah. make these? Because there's like <laughs> Del Fleet yeah. Neon Offender. That's a dog that that's a, that's a cool name, and uh, all these different yeah. names you have. Del, there. Del, yeah, yeah. Well, Del, Del Fleet is Mr. Crisp. Crisp was a breed of Del Fleet. That's his mm. prefix. Mm. Okay. So uh, every dog he breeds is is, is Del Fleet. Ne and he called him actually called him Neon. That's quite an interesting little story actually because I I bought a, a puppy out of that litter. And I kept it till it was a year year old. It had a high hip score, so I, I moved the puppy on, and then that left me with a hole in my kennel, because at that stage I was a full time employee at Rolls Royce, uh -huh. so I only had a, a couple of dogs, and I, I wanted a young dog to bring on. And I remember Mr. Chris saying he always kept a puppy back to to sell a little, as a twelve month old dog. Mm. So I phoned him up and I said, "Did you keep a puppy back out of this litter?" And he said, yeah. He said, I, I said, oh, good. Can I come and look at him? He said, yeah. I said, oh, he's nice. I said, what's his name? He said, oh, Neon. I said, all oh, right. He said, I called him Neon. He said, because he thought he was the brightest in the in the litter. <laughs> so that's where, if that's true or not, I don't know. But that, that's where the, the Neon came from. And, of course, right. Fender was my prefix. So Del yeah. Fleet, Neon, or Fender Wood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's just, the, I mean, they're just, you, you, you do have the great names. So I think that really, really, really makes it. Do, um, do mm. other people who compete from other countries ever succeed in, in the IGL? Or is it just really, I mean, you guys understand the terrain. You have the, the kind of home field advantage. Do people ever come from the States or Canada or other places of Europe and compete and do, do successful? Um, I don't think there's ever anyone being from the States or Canada. As I've seen, they mm -hmm. came to the Skinner's World Cup once. It's been um, uh, Peter, uh, no, you're going to get me now trying to pronounce <laughs> his name, Peter v Vivis, Vivils. Uh -huh. He's he's on a golden goldie this year in the IGL. I think Kurt Beckensteiner, he run um, a Labrador a few years ago. Uh, Rita Kakuni from... Um, uh, Rita come from Hungary. She she ran a nice a nice black bitch, and, and as far as I'm aware, there's, I don't think anyone's ever featured in the awards yet. Could be wrong, but you know there's, there's quite a few people come to England now. And to be honest with you, they have second homes, and you know they spend a, a lot of time in England and you know enjoying the fantastic sport it is over here because there's so much opportunity. There's so many competitions and so many states, you know, which it, it, perhaps a little bit more difficult to do uh, in Europe. So, yeah, there's one or two people doing that and they're getting much better. You know, that more opportunity they, they have, more you know, more success they're going to get. Yeah. Well, I don't think anyone has quite yet featured in the awards, but I'm sure it'll happen soon. 
It's been going on. The IG has been going on since 1909, I think, or something. It's, a, it's not a short, it's not a, a, a young yeah. sport. And you've won it four no, times. So it's a very old tradition. Yeah. No, when is when is number five going to be? Is it 2021? Oh, is it 2022? <laughs> are you ready? Are you are you having you know. are they having the IGLs this year? Uh, well, hopefully this year. Yeah. I mean, obviously last year it was cancelled, but mm -hmm. if if things go according to plan and we get control of this virus, then yeah, let's hope so. Yeah. T tell me something when you when you go out there because it's it's very very different from what we see here in, in field trials and stuff like that. I mean, it's just this amazing. And if people haven't seen it, really should watch it on YouTube because it's it's epic to watch. There's just, there's groups of people and dogs, and they're moving and moving and moving. And then how do they like what happens and what what's your mindset? Because there's probably what twenty dogs or so or more in that first group before they get eliminated. Oh, they are out now. There's nearly seventy dogs in the IGL wow. now. We're getting wow. onto in the in the you know it's a, it's a tremendous. Um, I mean the the feeling when you on the first day when you get to the IGL is like it's out of this world. You know there'll be yeah. three or four hundred people there from all over the world watching sixty yeah. nearly seventy dogs qualified on on wow. the first day. You know it's a tremendous amount of game to get through. All walked up, all natural. Mm. You know. You know the the, feel, the the buzz you get is, I mean that once you've been there, mm. you, know, you you want that again big time. Yeah. You know, I, I said to my good friend Les Earl the first time he qualified, I said, you know, your only problem is now. He said, what's that? I said, you want this again? <laughs> the first time it doesn't happen, you're so upset. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. So what 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 happens? Like, do you see people looking and going, oh, damn it, Latham's here again. He's gonna he's gonna kill us. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think, yeah. I mean, you you need a good dog. You need to be a good handler, and you you need yeah. a big stroke of luck, don't you? But you know, yeah. all them dogs that get to the there that have won two day opens, they've all got the chance. They're all capable of winning. You know, there's such a lot of people now putting a lot of time and effort into this. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. gone from just this little nice little hobby. It's it's you know it's serious now. It's it's big business, and there's a lot of good men and women out there who can win. Yeah. But they still see you and they go, I can't believe Latham's here this year. It's going to, it's going to suck, right? I mean, there's no way we're getting through him. I mean, there's got to be, I mean, like when Tiger Woods shows up, they, probably, sure, they, no. they say that, right? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what they think. <laughs> Maybe it's good, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so when you go out there, do you have that mindset? Like nothing is going to, like, let's say you, your car gets dinged in the parking lot as you're unloading your car, you're unloading your dog. Do you have that mindset? Like, I'm here to win. I don't, my car can blow up when I walk away from it. I don't care. Like, how do you separate those? You know, you, 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 you had an argument with the, the plumber or something. Um, now you're heading to the IGL. How do you turn off everything in your mind and just say, this is it. All, all that exists is me, my dog and the, and, and the, the bird. Yeah. 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 Again, interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I see it as a, a huge opportunity. You know, opportunity to make history, opportunity to win, and you, you want you want to you want to take that opportunity, don't you? So mm. I mean, the the pressure building up to the IGL is is pretty immense, you know, with yourself and and your training. If you want it, I mean, I think some people when they get to the IGL, they're not really as keen as they should be, uh, because I think they, they feel like they've they've achieved the goal by getting there, but the goal mm. really has only just started. And the goal is to is to get through to that third day. You know, it's such a an out of seventy seventy finest dogs in the in the country and and Europe and, and anywhere else who, who comes to compete. You know, you, you want to get through to that third day. And I think there's two things you don't want to go out the first round because you spent <laughs> all that time, all that money, all that emotion, all that effort. You know, and you packed everything. You're there for for a week. And there's nothing worse to go out your first bird. It's an absolute horrible <laughs> feeling, but right. it happens to us all. Unfortunately, you have to learn to live with it. But again, it's to me, I say it is is the opportunity. What I've, what I've worked for? I mean, what if your dog's probably three years old? If you're lucky when it gets there first, you know, and that, you want to you want to take that opportunity, don't you? Yeah. How, you know, so, so your mindset saying, has to be right. You're keen. Yeah. 
So you're saying three years old is something really important. So at which age, like at what point do you think a dog is ready to start trialing? And do you believe that you should wait until the dog is completely ready? Or do you think you should trial the dog all the way up to get him used to trialing? Mm, yeah, good question. I mean, I think most dogs, I mean, it's quite early for a dog at three. Mm. But I mean, if you take Drake said Dina, she was 19 months old when I, when I took her to the championship. Wow. I think she's actually the youngest dog ever in history to go to the championship. I think old John held the record, as he holds most records. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think his bit was 21 months and Dina was, Dina was 19. And she was one retriever winning the championship. But she wow. was you know, so mature and so, so mentally mature for a dog of that age. Mm -hmm. you know, she was good enough and I knew she was good enough. Where I think with some of the dogs, you think, well, next year, I mean, like take, take Rocky, the dog I've made into champion this year. I mean, this year he came of age. Mm -hmm. He's had an absolutely fantastic year. Had a, he's won three one day opens, had a second and just one trial where we had nothing. You know, he's really matured and he needed that bit of time in his mind. Mm -hmm. He needed last year where I was getting seconds and thirds and tickets just not quite got the edge where well, some dogs need a little bit of time to grow up like people you know mm -hmm. some some people mature quicker than others and i think dogs are just the same you know like like this young dog i have now cash he's quite laid back quite he's, he's very mature for his age you wouldn't think he was a 20 month old dog mm -hmm. you know so again they're all a little bit different and it, it's, it, does color play a difference in the dog, in the genetics? I know in shepherds, a lot of times darker, like black shepherds have more of an underlying defensive or aggression drive. Do you notice any difference in the genetics of yellow labs versus the black labs? Or the, I guess the fox reds don't really, you don't really, do, you don't see them that much occasionally. But um, what do you see a genetic difference in the coloring of the dogs? Is what I'm trying to ask. None at all. Absolutely None. nothing. Interesting. No, I mean, some, I've had some people say to me, yellow ones are not, it's hard in cover, but I think it's absolute rubbish. If you hmm. look at Bailey, when Bailey's been picking up his, his cut and his bleeding brambles, and no, yeah. I don't think there's any difference at all. What, what was Bailey's winning retrieve when he, when he won the IGL? What was, just walk me through that. What, what happened? Were you, you, you were there, the, 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 the shot, the line. I mean, it's, I just love to hear your play by play you're an announcer mm. how, how do you describe it yeah i think i'll i'll describe two retrieves actually and better the first retrieve is what what yeah what people may have not seen as much or may have not been on the video as much there was a we just walked through this rough field that was called scrub ground where there's a light cover and a hen bird i think it was a hen bird was shot and it flew right on and it's my retrieve. I spun round to watch it and it went, I don't know, four, five, six hundred yards. We watched it fly and it dropped out of the sky. So I thought, oh, thank God that's gone away. It'll be one for the pickers up. <laughs> of course, young Billy doesn't like to leave anything, does he? So Billy had seen this bird down. So he says, come on, we're going to pick that bird. And I thought, oh, no, because there's no way we had a, a really good mark on it. And we, it took me to a, a point where I could see. I don't know, I'm just guessing, maybe 150 yards away. Mm -hmm. And uh, we gave me a rough area. But but to get to that area, and you, you're at Ampton, Great Livermere, where there's thousands of birds, that, you know, a lot of game sent. And he had to go through a 60, 70 yards of dead ground out of sight. Now, if that dog had not kept a good line, that's mm -hmm. going back to me training today, hold the line where the point, don't go where you want, don't go where the ground's easy. And he came out in the position where I could see him, then I could handle him onto the bird. Now, that was a bird, if I hadn't picked, I would have never got to pick me winning retrieve. <laughs> so that was a, wow. that was probably, in my opinion, one of my best retrieves of the championship. But a lot of people wouldn't have seen that or wouldn't have realised. Yeah. So that then gave me the opportunity to pick me runner, which everyone talks about and everyone sees. And... I mean, it was a fantastic runner. I mean, they shot this, this this pheasant just in this dip and I sent Bailey straight away. And if I'd, if I'd have trusted him straight away and let him go, he'd have picked it a lot quicker. 
but I wasn't hundred percent sure it was dead. He only it was only shot low. Mm. He, he hit the fall, and he went. And you you see this on the video. I stopped him three times. I pulled him back, put him back on the fall. He went again. But you have to put this through your mind: is there'll be hundreds of birds walking up in front of you. Is he on the bird? Is he on a live bird? Once I've let him go from that area, I can't bring him back. So on the third time, I thought, well, you're telling me now that this bird's gone. So I let him go. And you asked Kevin Dowerty, Kevin was judging. He'd gone about, I don't know, he went a hell of a way, didn't he? He'd gone 70, 80 yards. I still got my whistle in my hand. And Kevin said to me, you don't need that whistle now, David, because he's not coming back. So I, I just spat the whistle out of my mouth. I crossed my fingers and he went down the sugar beet, 100 <laughs> mile an hour, picked this bird. And, and there was a stand innovation, like, you know, it was absolutely, I mean, that was my winning retrieve, but if mm. I hadn't have done that the first one, I would have never got there. Wow. I, I got goosebumps. Just I was, I was there with you the whole time. It was amazing. Oh, I, yeah. I just got shivers yeah. in my, my body yeah. just listening to the, the play-by-play. Play. Yeah. I mean, what an amazing connection yeah. to think about that. You've got this dog, a completely different creature, and this is like the thing that fascinates me about dogs. We let them into our lives. They're these other animals, and they're in our lives. They sleep in our homes and our beds, and they they almost telepathically are able to communicate with us in so many ways, don't you think? It's this dynamic connection yeah, between unbelievable. us. unbelievable. Yeah, so amazing, yeah, right? Yeah, it's unbelievable when, it, yeah, when you have that feel with them. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. Amazing what, what they can actually feel off us that we don't know. That's the, a big component, because I always talk about that when I'm working with shelter dogs or dogs with aggression. It's like they're picking up something that you don't even know you're feeling. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you yeah you're, you're dead right. And that's, that's going back to these people who are a little bit stressy. A little tiny mm. bit of stress for that animal must be amazing. Yeah, when you think a dog can, can sense that, the, that little bit of blood off that bird's wing or leg, and, and like Bailey can nearly, Bailey has the ability to, to take a runner nearly at full speed. Because there was a lot of debate about this retrieve, certain mm. lads said he, he was coursing, chasing the pheasant, which is mm. absolute rubbish. The bird had gone 20 seconds. If you, it's all on the video, you can see it. But, I mean, but because he can has the ability to run so fast and take a runner, and of course it was in sugar beet, so he was going down a drill. Mm. So it makes it a little bit easier. But you know, you're dead right. Going back to your original question, how, how they can process that so quickly off a little bit of scent. Yeah. And if they can do that, they, they must be able to read us like a book. Yeah. Also that connection, right? I mean, that connection that the dog is out there working for us. He's doing what we want. And it doesn't matter whether it's a sp agility or protection sports or obedience or, or gun mm. dogs. They're really, they're, their yeah. greatest joy isn't the treat we give them or the toy we give them, but it's that satisfaction of pleasing us. And I always talk about that with people that they're always trying to give too many treats or too many toys or too much where the dog's happiness is made up of just that, that bond. Like we're doing this, we're in this together. I don't need a treat. I don't need this. I don't need, although I use it, but it's so, so overlooked the importance of that bond. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's go going back to, to picking the puppy. Mm -hmm. That's why I want that puppy that wants to be with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, people mm -hmm. say to me, do I, do I use treats or anything? I say, no, I've never used treats in my life. I, I'm the treat. And yeah, I looked at yeah. Kennelly sees me. Right? He wants to be with me. <laughs> with, with, yeah. with that relationship, you mm -hmm. don't need no more. Yeah. Natural what could be drive. Better, right? Yeah. What could be better than being with us? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's why I like to keep my dogs singular mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a kennel on their own. Uh -huh. So they're not content with another dog in the kennel. Or when mm -hmm. when I'm there, they see me, and that's what they want. It, yeah. it helps to build that bond. So your dogs are mostly kenneled when they're not training. Do do you believe that that's that builds that bond yeah. stronger? Um, yeah, I think. I mean, they have the free time. My my, my dogs they go out in the in the morning at seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. We go for a, a, go for a run, and then predominantly I'm out training, you know, with somebody or something, so that they'll they'll get exercised. But I don't like them just wondering about i mean mm. it's just a personal thing really i mean some people sure. have the dogs in the house and mm. they do they do fantastic they're with them all day they're equally as good as my dogs but me personally i like i like to be with them and i socialize with them and i like mm. to pet them and, and, and let them be dogs mm. but 
you know, I also like them to have the time in the kennel, whereas you're not just doing their own thing, too much messing about. So mm -hmm. A little bit in between, really. Yeah, but it brings I mean, it the focus both to ways. you. Yeah, it brings the focus I really so, to yeah. you, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, th yeah, I think a lot of times yeah, it's, it's more of a punishment. It's a punishment a lot of times. I see people, the dogs are running around, they're playing with another dog, and then they put a leash on them and start yanking them. Hey, pay attention to me, look at me, this and that. Where you've given mm. the dog too much freedom to actually now now training becomes exactly. a, a chore as opposed to a reward if the dog is more isolated before Quite training, right. right? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, well put. Yeah. So, in, in, in just a couple of last thoughts. One is um, obviously you do a lot of training. You have a lot of confidence. You see the dog um, succeeding in the training you're doing. You kind of understand where the dog is going. Does that help you stay calm in a trial, or is it just like I said, that mindset that doesn't matter what happened before I got here, I'm here to win, and, and, you know, and that's it. And how would you kind of maybe encapsulate that as an advice for somebody who's just starting out in, in gun dogs? Mm, yeah, I think, I think a lot of it is actually in, in your makeup as a human mm -hmm. being, because you're under a tremendous amount of pressure in a field trial. You know, I mean, you take the IGL three days, walking in line, especially if you have two dogs, you're, near, yeah, you're going back in the line all the time, you're scrutinised all the time, the whole world's watching you. Mm. I mean, it's, it's an Im immense amount of pressure. And if you have a little bit of pedigree about you, they're watching you even more, and the slightest mistake becomes a huge mistake. So you feel all that, and it's not easy. Uh, and I think it's it. It's a very natural thing. Some people deal with it better. I mean, I know people in this country who are absolute fantastic trainers, probably as good as anybody, but haven't got that mental ability to, to be in that position for to be put out. You're there to be shot at, aren't you? Mm -hmm. you know, people are looking to see what you do wrong. And, you know, it's a, it's a funny sport. No matter how good you are, you know, you, you're there all the time. So... I don't, how how do you deal with it? I think it's just I think it's, it's a very natural thing you have. You, you need to be calm and relaxed and mm -hmm. take a deep breath and try not let all the seriousness get to you and, and focus and do your own thing. Mm -hmm. In other words, just enjoy the enjoy it for being there. Enjoy it for the moment. Don't think about the end result unless you're there to win, like you are. <laughs> no, right? No. Unless you know you're going to. No, because you're, you know you're, you're not actually. You're not actually. Yeah, you're not. Do, do you know, like, when you go out there, do you have that Sorry? feeling like, like, you know, you know, not not only confidence or or bravado, but when you go out there, do you have this feeling like, I got this? And I'm not saying cockiness, but I'm saying confidence, right? Like, it doesn't matter. Before, it doesn't or, matter after, you, before or after during, the show. During, during, like, while you're walking the line, your first day, second day, do you feel like, okay, we've got this. We're going to just do this. We're going to put one foot in front of the next, because that's how I kind of exemplify confidence or, or being calm just just do it just be it feel it do it do you, do you ever have that or are you nervous saying oh shoot i don't know what, you know what's going to happen here hmm. yeah yeah i think I, I think a little tiny bit of nerves is good because it keeps you mm -hmm. on your toes if you mm -hmm. if you have no and people say to me i'm not nervous and to me i think well you haven't got that will to win mm. because i you know you, you need that little bit of nerve because i don't want to go home and go back home and say, oh, I'm out, I'm lost, uh, mm -hmm. I've been eliminated again. Oh, you, know, you want that drive to win. So, I th But I think you, you have to be confident in your ability of your dog, you know, that, that, that mm -hmm. it can do everything. There's no point in going to a field trial and knowing you've got a, a serious eliminating fault because for sure, by the end of the day, they will find it. <laughs> right. You know? right. So, but, but I think to be... I, would, I don't think I've ever been to a trial and think I'm going to win because there's so many things that are against you, aren't they? You, you mm -hmm. wait, what number you pick, what bird you pick. I mean, we all know some birds. I mean, take take when I ran Bailey in, in Scotland in, in the in the championship. I was I think it was number two. It was eight o'clock in the morning, frosty, cold, you know, no scent. We walked a snipe bog with with rushes from three foot to six foot high. The, the the walking gun got too far. He got seventy yards away. They shoot a snipe, you know, a little tiny snipe, this mm. big. <laughs> Sent Bailey out, you know. He, to be honest with you, I mean, I can't believe he marked it, but he went straight mm. to the fall, 
course, what did he bump into? A load of live pheasants. Birds everywhere, <laughs> birds everywhere, flushing all these birds. And this sniper, when he eventually picked it, it had moved about 10 or 15 yards, it had run. And I remember they called me up, and I'm pretty sure to this day, when the judges look back look back at that, they'll think, you know, was that was was I called up too quickly? Could anybody else have done that any better? You know, you know, and that's the thing against. I went out, I really did nothing wrong. In fact, I did a damn good job, and I, I accept. I went out, and probably I'd have done the same thing if I was judging. But that's the difference. The next dog goes along and gets a nice big cock pheasant shot at thirty yards. Mm. And that that's the the beauty of trialing. You don't mm -hmm. know. It's not like a working test where all 70 competitors get the same retrieve. Right. Some get the easy ones. If I'd have picked it, I'd have been on a high. You know, mm -hmm. what a start that would have been to pick a bird like that. But mm -hmm. I didn't. And that's mm -hmm. that's how close it is. From, mm -hmm. from A, I went home, never picked a bird, to picking that would have been right up there. You know, so mm -hmm. I think that's why it's a fascinating sport. You know, you yeah. never get bored of it. You know, You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, it's a very unique yeah, sport so too. I mean, most other day. most other sports really are. Here's the goalposts. I mean, in, I think in the IGL, the goalposts are oh. constantly moving, aren't they? Oh, I mean, yeah. Get, I mean, the goalposts are getting higher and higher and higher. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. to, there's some some super dogs now, but you, you're dead right. You, you never know what you're going to get, and that's and I think that's that's the beauty of it. If you're the if you're the fastest runner in the world. And you know you're going to go to that meet, and you know you're going to be there knocking about right, right. first, second, or third, depending on on your start. But when you come to a like the IGL or a field trial, you could have the best. Everyone could might think, "Oh, you've got the best dog here," with the wrong bird or the wrong situation, mm -hmm. a tree in the way, a, a bad bit of ground, undulating ground, a runner. Mm -hmm. You're going mm -hmm. home. It's as simple yeah. as that. I mean, that that is the beauty of you. Do need your look a run of birds. Mm -hmm. And really, that's what we're competing against. We're competing against the ground and the birds and the guns, as yeah. opposed to the competitors. Right, right. When you it's think just about fascinating. it, just fascinating. So what's, yeah, what? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. So what? What is? What? What's the rest of the training season look like for you leading up to your next trial? Um, now it's slightly, slightly different time of the year now. It would, if it would have been a normal year, shooting season is now finished. Oh, so no. they'd have a little bit of a rest. And then I'd be getting ready for the, the England. Because, I'm, you know, with being the England captain, I'd be getting ready to for select the retrievers. So my training changes now, really. Mm -hmm. I'm going back to basic training now. I want my dogs to run again. As, as we know, we've, we've all done a lot of shooting. We've done a lot of picking up. So the dogs are got into hunt mode where they want to go 10 yards and get the nose down and hunt mm -hmm. and find wounded game. But of course, now you go into a working test scenario and they want you to go 200 yards in a straight line. Right. So that's, that's a hard thing though for the dog to change, right? I've always seen that when dogs start to oh, stop training will, short, will, will change. It will, okay. So you need to change that up because the dog, any dog that's used to a short retrieve to get them to go further, it needs the dog needs to increase their confidence and their focus to keep to keep driving exactly. through these other scents, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So the, the, this is the summer season's completely different. I'm thinking about the game fair, England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, the Skinners mm -hmm. World Cup mm -hmm. against the rest of Europe, and you know, Canada and, and the US have, were hopefully going to come this time, which would have been nice. Mm -hmm. but unfortunately, it's been cancelled because it's early on. So oh. me, me focus is mainly on them things. Scoon Palace is the, is the next one in Scotland, home international. So I'm looking at other dogs, looking at other people, trying to get myself and my dog ready. I mean, we go out with a group of friends on a Saturday. And we're all mm -hmm. going together and we're all, that's what we want. I mean, because I have to be selected for the team as well. Mm -hmm. So although I'm the captain, the selectors, the judges on the day, if I don't perform, you know, I'm out and it's something I want. Right, you know, next to the IGL, I, I see that getting into the England team is my second biggest goal. Awesome, well, I'm rooting you know, for so you, James. Really rooting important for, you. We're for all, me. We're rooting for you. Well, yeah. So let's hope we can also we can have some internationals this year. 
Yeah, yeah. You know what, I'd love to ask you, is there anything that, um, where can people find you? If people are going to listen to this podcast on a regular audio podcast, then they'll see the YouTube one as well. Um, is there, One thing I, I want to stress is you're, you're now selling these amazing training vests, right? And I ordered one for Janet yeah, for, Val yeah, for Valentine's but... Day. Romantic guy I am, right? Good. Yeah, <laughs> um, so very that'll nice. Be coming don't soon. don't yep. forget the bottle of wine. <laughs> no, bottle of wine and, and some, some flowers and, and, a, and, and a great... Uh, Fenda vest. So where can they learn? And it is a very, very, very cool vest. I'm, I'm so into vests. And this is a really well made, very functional product. And if you're into field trials and stuff, this is, I mean, it looks cool, one, but two, it's really functional. Um, where can they learn more about that? Where can they order one? Uh, well, you can order these vests direct through me, through my website. Mm -hmm. You can also there's a few outlets as well. Gundog Gear, Gary McCarthy, mm -hmm. uh, he he advertised them on 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 his internet site, mm -hmm. and uh, Woof It Mix, Tony O'Hare, uh, he sell dog food. Woof It Mix dog food. They also sell them. So there's three outlets there where okay. they can they can buy them. Okay, or direct from you, like I did. Yeah, or direct from me. Yeah, but get yeah, there, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think the 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 the, the for me, the best thing with the vest is is, is 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 just being able to put dummies and burrs in your back without breaking your arms. Yeah, yeah. There's some yeah. there's some super vests, there, but a lot of them you can't get anything in. You mm. know, and, and I've been wearing this vest now for the last twenty five years, so they're, they're very functional. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, but it's your design, right? This is your. Yeah, I've tweaked it over over the last few years. I've had yeah. you know several different ones made. I've, I've I've changed the front a little bit because the front used to ride up a little bit with the weight in the back. So I oh, have yeah. the front made lower. So so it's only natural it has to come up through the weight in the back and I'm, an additional pockets put in and made the shoulders bigger and smaller over the years. And we're, we're getting we're getting nearly there now. <laughs> good, good. Now, I know you're more serious than a lot of people, but you're not on Instagram or Facebook or any of the social media sites, are you? No, 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 I'm, 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 I'm on Facebook, but I might just, I only ever put probably one post if I'm lucky enough to win or make a dog up, but I'm, okay. I'm not, I don't put my Sunday dinner on there, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea not to do that. <laughs> it keeps you happy in life. <laughs> Nothing but depression exactly. going on there, right? But um, I'm going to put links down to, um, to under the under the video, I'm going to put some links down to, to order your vest and to, to learn more about you and stuff like that. Um, you're, you're an amazing, yeah. fascinating guy. I really appreciate you taking this time with me. Um, and I just would love to give you an open invitation to come back on, um, at any time, just to talk about, uh, life and, and, and dogs, you, you know, I just, I just love yeah. your energy and, and like that. I think it's really, really a nice chat. Yeah. Well, I've been very, very good of you to ask me and I thoroughly enjoyed it and maybe we'll get some feedback off this and maybe there'll be some questions that people yeah. are interested in. Yeah, we, well, could, we'll we another, could answer we'll, those. We'll do another chat. Then let's do that. If people have questions, um, submit them under the video or send them me an email yeah. with them, and we'll do another chat with Dave Latham. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. I mean, we're rooting for you. Let's let's get a two or three more, you know, IGL championships. We got we got to see this. And Janet, I'm going to come <laughs> see you one time. A dream come true. <laughs> yeah, in the next yeah, couple of years. Yeah, why not get yourself over to England? I would love to. I mean, it's, 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 it's an absolute bucket list trip for Janet. So we're, we're going to do it one in the next couple of years. Once all this uh, nonsense clears up with the virus, we're going to get over there and we're going to watch an mm. IGL in person. It'd be fun. Yeah, well, why not? I'll be looking forward to seeing you, Robert. It'd be good. Yeah, we'll have a pint together. <laughs> or two. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah, don't stop at one. All right, well, great. Let me, uh, I'm going to end this recording. Thank you guys for tuning in. Don't hang up just yet, yeah, David. Hang on one second. Um, guys, thank you. This was an amazing chat with David Latham. I mean, one of the legends of, of gun dogs. Um, I want to thank for being here. Guys, check out my website, robertcabral.com, the YouTube channel, um, and everything. Thanks for being here, and um, I'll see you next time. Take care.